We're in a world of, uh, of grass basketball where it's hard to keep even three touchdowns off the board. That's kind of like the old 10 points to me. Um, so we're going to talk about that. LT Overton, 280-pound ass kicker. That is what Coach uh, Kane Womack referred to him yesterday. We're going to play that sound bite. Uh, also talk about Jalen Mbakwe and ready to see a role with this Alabama team. Not, you know, he, he did get some reps with the ones, and you're certainly going to see him play, which is amazing. Like, in-state guy, um, another guy on the defensive side. I know, you, you know, a lot of hype on different players. Like, don't forget about Jalen Mbakwe. Um, certainly going to play a ton this year. We're going to talk about the inside linebacker position and how it's changed um, from Coach Saban's defense to now Coach Womack's offense and how that will allow Deontay Lawson to play a little bit more free and just be the guy that he is, along with Jahad Campbell and Justin Jefferson. And we're going to talk about uh, point eight, which is helmet communication. This year, I mean, this is a new, there's so many new intricacies this year to college football. Helmet communication is certainly going to be one of them. I can't wait to see which team can utilize that best, whether on offense, defense, and how these teams are able to adapt uh, going into this season. So Kyle Henderson, Bama Football on YouTube, I appreciate you guys being here. Thank you so much. Take a minute, please, and hit the thumbs up. We got 67 watching right now on Bama Football on YouTube. As we look at that running back room, let's start right here and uh, kind of recap yesterday's news now there was uh three running backs in black jerseys now black jerseys that you know it basically means they're limited for that time that's a viewing period now there's been times where the the media leaves and these guys rip off their black jerseys and they're 100 percent good to go during practice now these guys are going through repetitions the only guy that wasn't going through repetitions is daniel hill because he's literally in a sling that's the update that i don't think anybody has which is on daniel hill um, who was spotted in a sling during alabama's open practice on sunday he's a freshman uh, 241 pounds really excited to see what he can do for Alabama this this season or when he gets opportunities I mean he's out of Mississippi uh, um, big time uh, running back he's the biggest running back on the team and I think next is uh, Richard Young who's 220 pounds or whatever Justice Haynes the only running back right now that is um, you know fully healthy I look I, I wouldn't be too worried about the health of the running back room I, I think they're going to be fine what, what you need to read into is the fact that Saturday's scrimmage was a hard-hitting scrimmage. I think that's good for the defense. I, I think, you know, we've been hyping up this offense. The offense did have, um, you know, some success in that scrimmage. I would say the offense probably won that scrimmage. Uh, but look how physical it was. And I think that's a good sign for the defense. You want these guys to play uh, physical. I mean, Sunday's open practice, They, I, the guys were going, I don't know, 70%. I said 80% yesterday. Um, it, it just, you know, I mean, they, they were just out there for fan day. But Saturday, they got it going. Uh, let me give some shout-outs real quick. I appreciate you guys. D. Harsh, what's up, man? I appreciate the feedback regarding the intro. Um, we'll start up, the, up at the top. We got uh, Dominique, what's going on? Uh, saying that uh, Cole Adams has changed his number to seven. Yep, absolutely right. Um, Southern Red, what's up? I see you in the house. Uh, Chris from New Jersey. Lee, what's going on? I appreciate you being a fan. Funder. Jonathan, uh, what's going on, man? Marcus uh, Cottrell. Chris from New Jersey. Uh, Jordan, what's going on, man? Appreciate you being here. Thank you so much. Byron, what's up? Old uh, rock guy up in the house. Um, we got Max Tooney, Jay Lee, um, Jonathan, one more time. Bama in GA Outdoors, what's going on? Ryan Wingo, what's going on? I, I see you. Uh, Larry Williams, um, and, and everybody up in the house. So uh, definitely get inside that comment box, and I appreciate you guys being here. Um, so talking about that running back room, look, I, I think they're going to be fine. So I, I kind of wanted to lead off with that point. Um, I wanted to play a soundbite um, that people were talking about yesterday um, from Kirby Smart. Okay, so Kirby Smart is talking about kind of the lack of depth that his team has. And, you know, more and more he's kind of seen like a deterioration in college football. Honestly, I think it's kind of like he's kind of like playing the poor me's. I don't like when coaches do this, to be honest. Um, he's got plenty of talent. The way that he has been recruiting, the way that his roster is lined up this year, they're the preseason number one in every single magazine, every single um, online publication. Here's that uh, soundbite real quick from uh, Kirby Smart, and then we'll talk about it. we got a long way to go as a football team. We are nowhere near where we close close to where we need to be i feel like we have less depth than we've ever had and that's kind of a common theme talking to other coaches i talk to i i call it the de deterioration of football because every year we've been here i feel like we've had more players uh capable of going in and play winning football and every year that goes down so we've got to keep working to increase that number 
that's Kirby Smart talking about kind of the lack of depth or whatever at UGA. Look, they've had some off the field issues for the last couple of years. Uh, independent, I see you, man. Uh, thank you for very much, man. I see the elephant emojis. Uh, Georgia, look, they've had some off the field issues for several years, um, the several past years. I mean, it happens at every program. It seems that Georgia, there's you know, um, you know, some stuff that maybe he can't seem to control, whatever it is. But I mean, regarding depth, I, I don't really buy that. Um, I think there's a lot of guys on that roster that could play anywhere in the country. Same thing with the Alabama Crimson Tide. Um, I don't, you know, it, it's rare that you see Kirby do that. Um, I don't know if he's kind of, you know, with a with the loss of like Ra Ra and some of the other guys that they don't have. I, I don't know. I, I still think they're going to be in a fine position. Now I can't wait to see when they come to Alabama on the 28th, right? And you can hit that uh, UGA sucks uh, emoji right now inside the comment box. And they also go to the road and, and play Texas. They also play Ole Miss. All of those games are on the road. It's like, right, Brian? I'm not buying that either, man. Like, I look, he, I don't know how good he is at playing poker, but look, I'm calling his his cards on the table. Like this, this is the team that you know they're they're preseason number one. Their quarterback is elite. Their, their, their running backs, they have everybody on defense. They should be good. They enter the season winning their last 31 out of 32 games. They are look at this. They are a Four-point favorite over Alabama uh, uh, for that game uh, September 28th. By the way, uh, you know, uh, I, we all know what's coming from Alabama in that game, right? Uh, we appreciate the five fan funderships, man. Thank you so much for uh, continuing to contribute uh, right here on Bama Football on YouTube. Love the new avatar, Patriot Life. Thank you so much, man. Love the bracelets, man. I can't really see them, but I'm sure uh, you're hyping up somebody. So uh, thank you so much for helping build this community right here on Bama Football on YouTube. Um, are you buying it from Kirby Smart? I'm not, right? Like, like play the fiddle. Like, no, man. Like, we know you got a good squad, right? Depth isn't an issue. And it's not an issue here at Alabama. That's 100%. As we move to point three on the screen, and I appreciate you guys hitting thumbs up if you guys roll tight. 85 in the house. Uh, I appreciate you guys being here. Kyle Henderson, Bama Football on YouTube. Uh, run the thumbs up, and uh, we'll continue to cruise through the show. This, this was amazing. This made my ears perk up. I was like, okay, every single year, you know, you, you see in the NFL – Guys who are running over 20 miles an hour, right? I think, like, who's the fastest? Is it Cheeto who's running, like, what is he running, like, 25? Someone post that inside the comment box. Anything over 25, 20 miles an hour is, like, is extremely fast. So last season, you're telling me, and this is from Coach David Blue. I, I think he, he gave this uh, quote to 24-7. Last year, there was 20 guys running over 20 miles an hour for Alabama. This year, are you serious? There's 40 guys? 40 guys are running over 20 miles an hour? Like, man, Max Tooney, that's what I'm saying. No, no, not like the physical cheetah. I'm talking like Tyreek Hill. <laughs> Cheetahs are running, what, like 70 miles an hour. <laughs> but you get what I'm saying? Like, man, there's really 40 guys on this team that are running over 20 miles an hour. That is really incredible to me. I think David Ballou has done a really good job. I mean, I uploaded that short of him, uh, you know, getting up, what was it, 745 pounds. So he's practicing what he preaches. And the guy's an absolute monster inside the weight room. The depth of Alabama is so deep, and I love the team speed. I'm all about team speed, whether uh, I'm playing the silly video game, or I'm playing FIFA soccer, or in real life, I'm, I'm maximizing speed on the football field. Speed, I, honestly, I'm a proponent of speed kills. I, I really believe that, and I think in this 4-2-5 defense, and we're going to focus on the defense in this video, you have plenty of elite speed, right? Guys who are really fast, and I kind of point back to that um, footage of the inside linebackers. When we're watching these guys getting it going, um, it's really amazing to see. This is a, a videos of, of the tight ends who even look much more athletic. Yesterday, I commented um, you know, that the tight ends. It's like if I'm buying stock right now, like all the all the stocks are pretty high right now. Um, I was kind of curious to see like what this tight end room was going to bring out. But as you can see, like these guys are are really stock up for me. But as I move back to the defense. I mean, Deontay Lawson moving like he does at 250 pounds. You're going to hear from him uh, later on the show. Uh, same thing with Jahal Campbell. Same thing with Justin Jefferson. Justin Jefferson might be the fastest of that room with the inside linebacker position. If some of these guys are running over 20 miles an hour, I mean, you got to think, um, you know, that Justin Jefferson's probably one of them, which is really remarkable. So 40 guys, right, over 20 miles an hour. That just, I mean, th this might be the, is this the, is this the fastest team in college football? And, and what's crazy, I think the fastest overall player might be 
either Kendrick Law, like straight up, like if you guys were just, you know, top end speed or Jalen Milrow. I asked somebody, um, you know, who was faster between the two. I still haven't gotten an answer in terms of like who's the fastest. Has anybody heard? People you talk to, site to read, who's the fastest on the team is? I, that was a nice catch right there by Danny Lewis, by the way. Uh, this is Ty Simpson right here. Um, damn, that's a nice ball, Ty. Getting it to uh, number 89 right there. You know, I want to make sure I know who that Because a lot of those tight ends are all in the 80s. Number 89 is Ty Lockwood, and then 88 is Jay Lindsey. So that's Ty Lockwood. Ty Lockwood um, out of Tennessee Independence. He's a redshirt freshman. 87 is uh, Danny Lewis. Um, Kyle Anderson, Bama football on YouTube. Like uh, The team speed is certainly going to be elite, right? Um as we continue to navigate through the show, Kyle Henderson, Bama Football on YouTube, I appreciate you guys being here. Kind of, This is the meat of the show, where I'm going with it now. And it's the defensive standard at Alabama. Um, look, following Alabama the last you know eight seasons, one of the things that I quickly understood was how important defense was to the fans of Alabama football. And the defensive standard kind of spilled onto the overall mantra of the entire team. Right, You look at the past greats of Alabama football. You look at guys playing in the NFL. There's so many guys that played under Coach Saban that are now you know, playing high-level defense in the NFL. And I think one of the biggest pressure points of Coach Kane Womack taking over this defensive coordinator position is we all knew who the defensive coordinator was at least last season at Alabama, and that was Nick Saban. I think Nick Saban, he certainly was the guy that helped kind of bring back the defense, him and Kevin Steele um, and, and T-Rob. I don't know. Um, I, I think Lane Kiffin basically told everyone, like, what was happening, that Kevin Steele, you know, is like, you know, he was like the acting DC, but the main and, – and I think it was even Kevin Steele. Do you remember that press conference where he said that Coach Saban was the defensive coordinator? My point is he's a defensive mining coach. That's why it was amazing that he didn't make a, a move quicker um, to get rid of Pete Golding kind of there later in his career, right? It seemed like he let Pete Golding, who, who he was very fond of, um, and a really great guy in terms of understanding schematics, but it just didn't really go well with Alabama's overall defensive philosophy. Truth be told, I mean, the more and more I listen to Coach Kane Womack speak, I'm starting to like what I hear. Now, you can like what you hear, but what are we going to see uh, you know, when the first game of the season comes. The defense is going to be held to the highest standard because of how we view Alabama's defense. You have a lot of guys returning. It's a, def it's, it's a different defensive setup, but with Deontay Lawson, Jahar Campbell, LT Overton, we're going to talk about him in a second. They had a monster scrimmage. Jameer and Lathan. You know, this bandit position that they now have. Um, the wolf position looks very solid. I guess, you know, and as we know, the secondary is going to be tested and there's going to be a lot of question marks in the secondary. But I think my question is, is like, do you think that Coach Kane Womack, and this is a hypothetical question, do you think that he can hold Alabama to that defensive standard? Or has defense kind of gone out the window because of the changing of, of the guards in college football and how it's all up tempo style offense. The more point, you know, points win games. I get it. I just don't want to see the defense, you know, start surrendering 30 points, um, which I don't think is going to happen. I mean, there's too much talent out there, but the defense is going to be in a, under a microscope. 100%. Appreciate you guys being here. My name is Kyle Anderson of Bama Football on YouTube. This is my morning segment uh, live every uh, Monday through Friday. Uh, at 9 a.m. or as news happens. Um, and I appreciate you guys, you know, continuing to watch uh, the coverage right here on Bama Football on YouTube as we get uh, through fall camp. I wanted to ask you guys about, um, I'm sure you guys saw it. I mean, LT Overton had a really good scrimmage um, on Saturday. Um, kind of a disruptor, which is good to hear. I look at that bandit position as, you know, Jameer and Lathan, uh, Keon Keeley, LT Overton. A lot of these guys are going to fire for that spot. Uh, got got a really good soundbite right here of Coach Kane Womack uh, talking about uh, LT Overton who played out right now.
Uh, you know, LT um, has a great uh, skill set. You, you can tell he has honed in his pass rush ability. He's got really good complementary answers to his fastball. You know, um, he's a great speed to power rusher. Um, but you just, you know, he's done it probably a million times over his life, right? And he can feel, you know, whether the, the offensive lineman is on his top hip or his bottom hip and know how to counter back inside or outside. So he's a really great on body rusher, is what I would say, right? So that when he gets in, to the man he knows how to he knows how to counter back very quickly and you know he's 280 pounds right so and can move his feet so those things are really challenging for an offensive lineman to deal with I think him and Zebo Latham are are really the the frame right that's the ideal um, that person has to play a four eye they have to play a five technique they got to play a nine technique right um, occasionally right they'll fall back inside on the run fit some of those things right they can do a lot of different things um, but I'm impressed with their athleticism. I mean, those guys, they can really move. They can, um, they do a good job to be that big. Uh, so, yeah, I would say from a, you know, from a prototype bandit uh, position, the field defensive end, that makes things really challenging to, to, to establish runs to the field when you have a 280-pound ass kicker over there. So. That's uh, Coach Kane Womack talking about LT Overton. And, and I think when you look to um, – that bandit position and, and we'll look uh we'll navigate for that bandit graphic right now i mean there's so many guys that can you know he can rotate in and out and i think that's a position that people are going to be excited to see uh kind of under this no new four two five defensive front is which guys can stand out which guys can get after the quarterback and which guys can play at a consistent basis now in this four two five frame which we've talked about uh you have the d tackle which are guys who are bigger right tim keenan tim smith jaheem otis james smith james smith looks really good uh on Film each and every time you see him but this bandit position guys who are athletic guys who you know can uh, pass rush and uh, Jamarian Lathan is one of those guys that came Womack just mentioned but LT Overton I think stock up for him right stock up on the tight end room stock up for LT Overton um, certainly good to hear when you're talking about Alabama's defensive front and kind of getting back to the Alabama uh, defensive standard right I mean starts in the trenches right and, and Keon Keeley at, at some point in time and like he he looks good he's going to play this year uh, 100%. But when you look to, like, back to Kirby's, you know, comments saying that kind of, like, the t d the deterioration of depth. That, no, like, <laughs> the, the, the Georgia roster, we ran through it. You know, it would be very comparable, very similar to what Alabama has. Alabama has elite depth, and uh, the teams that are going to be able to survive this college football gauntlet of a season are going to be the teams that have uh, of the most depth. And, um, you know, I, I just uh, I can't wait to see it, to see what happens. Um with Alabama's um, overall depth. We talked about the running backs kind of being a little bit banged up. Uh, we talked about Kirby Smart. We talked about the team speed. We talked about the defensive standard here at Alabama. We talked about LT Overton. Uh, moving to our next point, which is talking about Jalen Mbakwe. Um, look, there is, a, there is a heavy competition for the corner spot opposite side of Damani Jackson. Right, that's truth, okay? I think right now, um, it's a pretty even competition at the corner position because of the fact that Zabian Brown um, did injure his hand. So now you have three guys probably vying for that spot. One is, uh, you know, Zabian Jones trying to fight off uh, the two challengers. And the two challengers are uh, Deshaun Jones, the Wake Forest transfer, and then also Jalen Mbakwe. Now, Jalen Mbakwe uh, comes to Alabama from uh, Clay Chalkville. He won a state championship. And I'm always going to give him credit for being able to, uh, you know, kind of be uh, this, the, the spearhead that landed Ryan Williams. I, I remember that. I, like, he actively recruited him, uh, played against him, and I think Ryan Williams had mutual respect for him, right? They knew they were going to be on opposite sides. Iron sharpens iron. And uh, it's good to see Jalen Mbakwe getting some notoriety. Sometimes people don't really talk about, um, you know, all of the freshmen that are, that could contribute. He will contribute. And Kay Womack uh, certainly said uh, that about uh, Jalen Mbakwe uh, recently. And here is uh, coach Kay Womack talking about Jalen Mbakwe. Uh, this was yesterday after practice. Oh, you know, LT um, has a great uh, skill set. You, you can tell he has honed in his. Sorry. That's uh, that, that's still the sound bite of, um, Kane Womack talking about uh, LT Overton. But basically, he goes to say uh, that, you know, he's really happy with the progress that he's been able to make. 
And, um, you know, he, he mentions this that kind of made my ears perk up as, as well is that he played a different position um, in high school. So that safety position. So making the switch from safety now to corner, which is, in my opinion, the toughest position to play in all of college football is ultra challenging. And imagine having to go up every single day against the Kendrick Laws. You know, let's say you get matched up with the Kobe Prentice playing a Husky position, or uh, you're playing against Ryan Williams or Jeremy Bernard. I mean, it's going to make you grow up in a hurry. That's why I can't wait to see kind of the development of uh, Jalen Mbakwe. And, and, you know, he's absolutely going to see a role this year. Let me ask you. Um, I always like to go to the comment box. Uh, type J. If uh, you've heard really good things about Jalen Mbakwe from the sites you read, other YouTube channels you listen to, have you heard uh, good things about Jalen Mbakwe? I'm curious to see this. Type J inside the comment box. Kyle Anderson of Bama Football on YouTube. Also uh, available on Spotify. Or see, Max is in there. Chris is in there as well. Um, I appreciate you guys. And uh, today I'm going to be taking phone calls uh, as well. So if you want to go uh, get in line, the call in line number is 205 205- 850-1994. It's up at the top left of your screen. So if you want to call and get in line, now is a good opportunity as I finish um, these next two uh, topics uh, on my left. So uh, 205-850-1995. And see, uh, I see the Jays coming in, right? You guys are absolutely hearing uh, good things about Jalen Mbakwe. And you know what's happening? Like, you know, it, it's kind of interesting. And it, it's still surprising to me because, like, man, for a freshman to be able to play at this level is just remarkable. And, like, you you know, there's all this hype about Ryan Williams, and you're like, okay, is he really going to play? Is, like, Jalen Baca really going to play? Is Xavier Brown really going to play? And then you go out and you, like, see the game, and they're, like, they're starters. They're playing, like, making plays. It, it's just crazy to see. You know, because I fought, I used to cover high school football for 12 years. And so understanding, like, and I have a teenager. Man, to think about someone 17 years old being able to play at this level is just phenomenal. Credit to, you know, the parents. And sometimes it's just natural. Natural ability. It just blows my mind. True freshman playing is absolutely wild. Um, want to talk about uh, the inside linebacker position uh, just real quick. Just hit on that. Um had a chance to hear from uh, Deontay Lawson yesterday after practice. And he, he and this is what made my ears perk up, perk up when, when listening to him. They, they asked kind of the, the difference between playing under Coach Saban's defense and Wamax. And he said that um, Coach Saban's defense was very, very complex for his particular position, inside linebacker. Now, he is the signal caller, right? And we're going to talk about helmet communication next. Literally, uh, Deontay Lawson is going to have, you know, uh, communication with Kane Womack during, like, before the play, right? So he's the he's Kane Womack on the field, and he's the defensive leader. Same thing with Malachi Moore. And he was saying that Coach Saban's uh, defense is super complex for that position. Now, under Kane Womack, his position, he has much more flexibility and freedom to just be an inside linebacker and to just play and to be that athlete. And I can't wait to see that. Because if you unleash Deontay Lawson, if you unleash Jaha Campbell, who knows what they're capable of. And I think each of them are up for uh, the Buckus Award, which goes to the preseason guys who are, you know, could be the best Defensive player in all of college football. Alabama has two of those guys, Jaha Campbell and Deontay Lawson, each listed on that prestigious award, right? That was an award that I think that William did William Anderson. I'm pretty sure he won that. If not, he was absolutely robbed. Um, so the, the helmet communication is super, super important to college football this year. Um, to give kind of a, an idea of just how important, here's a soundbite of Kane Womack and Deontay Lawson um, each talking about helmet communication and how that's going to impact uh, the Alabama Crimson Tide and the overall defense. We'll play that right now. That's a great question. I think time will tell. Um, you know, uh, we're... We're, we're different, you know, the NFL, right, they have pictures. So they have a picture, you know, whatever, four seconds before the snap, four seconds after the snap, right? In, in high school, you know, they've got, you know, big uh, home screen entertainment systems, right, that they, that they work on, right? And, and so then we have the iPads, right, the, and all those things. I think 
Um, what it will do is it will confirm, right, for a, from a defensive perspective, hey, did the ball hit in the B gap here? Did it fold outside, you know, our, our defensive end, or did it go inside here? Um, what route concept did they run? Okay, this was a, num a number two receiver on an over route, right? Those are the things that you can just confirm immediately and get corrected. So in that regard, right, you know, it, you never have those moments where you go, hey, on Saturday night after watching the game, right, that, oh, that's what they were doing. Um, good coaches, right, you try to minimize that, right? You try to be a human iPad, right, so that you can see things in real time and make adjustments, and we've taken great pride in doing that. So, you know, I wonder if it will be an equalizer to coaches that can't see in real time quite as well. Uh, but at the same time, right, it's, it's certainly going to be something that we're going to utilize as best we can. Say that one more time. Are we making too much of the green dot communication? Uh, uh, not really, because I mean it, it has it has it has its challenges. I mean, you know, once we get in the stadium and there's a hundred thousand fans, you know, uh, it can it can be challenging. So I mean, I don't think I'm making a big deal. It is a big deal, because I mean, if if we're not all on the same page, then that could be a touchdown, explosive play. That was uh, Kane Womack and Deontay Lawson talking about helmet communication. My name is Kyle Henderson of Bama Football on YouTube. I appreciate you guys being here. Um, 205-850, we're going to take some calls in just a second. I appreciate you guys being here, and I hope that you guys are off to an amazing Wednesday, August 14th. To watch today, you have uh, Alabama practice once again in fall camp. Uh, you'll hear from the offensive coordinator, Nick uh, Sheridan, later on today. Uh, we'll bring that to you right here on Bama Football on YouTube, and Alabama has another scrimmage this coming Saturday. You'll hear from uh, Coach Kalen DeBoer uh, following that scrimmage. Uh, let's go to the phone lines right now, and uh, we'll take uh, Chris from New Jersey. Uh, 973, you're up right now. Chris, what's up, man? Good morning to you. I appreciate you calling in. Uh, thank you for joining us this beautiful uh, Wednesday, August 14th, man. Come with it. Kyle, happy Wednesday. Um, so, I, you know, I, 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 want, I, I got to mention to you last time I called, but um, – so this is a, this is a little Milrow love, and I don't know if if you mentioned this or you caught this, but uh, uh, Kevin Sheridan was doing an interview, and he was you know he was uh, he was glowing about Milrow, but he, he at one point he kind of stops the the interview and he gets real serious and he says, "I hope that Jalen understands how much I and the entire coaching staff appreciate him." And I remember, I thought that's like the most glowing thing that anybody said about Jalen Milrow, I bet you, ever. And, mm. and I'll tell you why. You know why I, I think he said that, Kyle? Is, is because, we're, and, and I can't believe we haven't found it out, but, and you, you'll probably be the one to find it out, is, is I'll bet you almost every major program in the country was trying to poach Jalen Milrow. Yeah. So everybody... Anybody who thinks they have doubts about Jalen, you know I keep on writing in the comment box. And I will continue to write, Kyle. <laughs> Jalen equals Eisen. Um, so, uh, you know, and, uh, you know, so, uh, you know, I, I just – we need a little Wednesday Milrow love, Kyle. I, you know, I know you you had some Jan Miller. I, we love – I love Jan Miller, too. But I wanted no. some – and did you did, – did you know the, the uh, interview I'm talking about? Did you catch that? I, I didn't personally see that. Um, I'm not surprised to hear it because – of, um, you know, look, Jalen said it himself. I mean, this is, you know, the first really offensive coordinator that's, you know, I guess really believed in him. I, I don't really understand, you know, the um, the dynamics of him and Tommy Reese. But when Tommy Reese left, uh, it was Ty Simpson who posted a picture, like, with a little heartbreak that he was leaving the Browns. I didn't see anything from Jalen Milrow. Um, you know, I, I'm sure, you know, they had a working relationship or whatever, but he openly said that Nick Sheridan um, has been, you know, by far supportive of him at that quarterback position, helping him develop. And, and I think it, it's kind of a, a thing where um, a lot of fans kind of in that category aren't going to be happy with, you know, small clips of him throwing to Ryan Williams and um, some check downs. They want to see it happen in the game and they want to see it happen all season long. Um, but clearly the deep ball is there. I mean, think about this. I mean, the truth freshman 17 years old catching a 50 yard touchdown from a Heisman favorite I mean I think that's got to send um, shivers down the spines of the rest of the world of college football it probably does you know I, uh, I I've, I've officially named uh, Ryan Williams R. Julio Williams <laughs> 
I mean, he's gonna play. <laughs> he's gonna be hard to stop. Um, and look, he he went against. Uh, I mean, Deshaun Jones. Welcome to the SEC. I, I, I look, and even what uh, Deontay Lawson said. I mean, they're they're out there and they're seeing these guys. He's like, he said it yesterday on on his interview. He's like, yeah, it's amazing for a guy to be seventeen to be able to be able to understand concepts, man, zone. Um, but he also loves the, the fact that he's from uh, LA. That's Lower Alabama. I mean, each of those the the height the the football talent. In Alabama, that lower Alabama area is like on fire right now. Um, what else you got, Chris? One uh, okay. So uh, uh, speaking of that, that Alabama talent, and I'm going to continue to hound you about this, Kyle. Uh, three things: O Ford, O Ford, O Ford. <laughs> you got to get him, Kyle. Kyle, this is a, he's our new he's our new Ryan Williams. We got to get that guy. So mm. all right, and then one last thing I want to I want to mention is, um, you know, talk about, like, quarterback development. Mm. And I'm not saying we haven't had quarterback development in the past. But, you know, I, I, I don't – and I hope anybody in the other field takes this wrong. But, but you know, remember, DeBoer is like a – he's a quarterback whisperer, my friend. And um, um, I, I, and I did this the other day. I, I pulled up some way old videos of, 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 of the quarterback throwing from, uh, from last year. And, um, you know, you and I spoke about, like, um, uh, uh, you know, Milrose now throwing, like, NFL-looking darts. But you know who else is throwing NFL-looking darts? Ty Simpson. And is that – has the board just been working with them on motion, on – I mean, he – I mean, it's it, – he's – I mean, they're throwing, like – that's what the ball looks like in the NFL. And, you know, I'm not saying the other ones – the other ones are, are, are throwing good balls, but not like – I you know – Milrow and Ty Simpson, those balls are clearly different than the other quarterbacks. So, uh, you know, maybe we just have we got we got a whisperer, Kyle. That's uh, my my last piece uh, that I wanted to chat about. <laughs> so, anyway, listen, happy Wednesday. Thank you for what you do. My best to the undefeated, and uh, I'll, we'll talk soon. Roll Tide, my friend. All right, Roll Tide, man. Thanks for calling in. Um, that is uh, good buddy uh, Chris uh, in New Jersey uh, calling in from the nine seven three. We got seven seven zero up next in the call line. You know, th- there's a uh, there's room. So two zero five eight five zero nineteen ninety four. If you want to call, sign off on the Alabama Crimson Tide. Uh, please do two zero five eight five zero nineteen ninety four. The call line number is at the top left. We'll go to our seven seven zero in just a second. Um, yeah, I-, I think uh, Chris talking about the quarterbacks and having a quarterback whisper. Well, you know, for the defensive standard and and a defensive coach now you have an offensive minded coach and a guy that has done a really great job with quarterbacks in the past I mean the the job that he did with Michael Penix Jr. my goodness I mean the guy you you would turn on the Washington game I remember I was watching Washington and Oregon and um, I was just sitting back and really surprised and, and utterly impressed with the touch and the delivery from Michael Penix Jr. Now he had some absolute ballers at wide receiver. I think Jalen Miro has more talented wide receivers over here. Um, so look, the deep ball has been there. You guys want to see the short intermediate? One thing that we really didn't see under you know Washington's uh, you know schematics was the fact that look, Michael Penix had run. I mean, he's fast, dude, but it wasn't really part of his game. I think Jalen Milrow um, has that ability as well, which makes him ultra dangerous. And uh, you look at the six wide receivers that he could throw to, eight wide receiver deep, whatever Alabama is, it's clearly an embarrassment of riches. Uh, we go back to the phone lines uh, with the 770. I appreciate the call, uh, Chris, and uh, 770, let's do it. Hey, you're on the line with Kyle Hello, Anderson. This is me. Yeah, who am I on the line with and where are you calling in from? This is me, Lucas. I'm calling from um, Georgia. Lucas, what's up, man? I appreciate you being here, man. Come with it. All right. Um, I want to talk about the running back room. I know we, we banged up, but I'm not too worried about it because you know why? Because we still got a long ways to go for the season. Mm. I think these guys will be healed up. But the only guy I'm not expecting to be back, but that's okay, is the freshman who is the one that got his, got his arm in the sling. I'm not expecting him back. So, but the other two wearing the black jerseys, we would take them back in in the fold. But what we what what can we do is you I'm maybe we can move Danny Lewis over to the running back room because I think he will fit that style, his ability, catching because he's because he's big like a running back. So that way it doesn't hurt your tight end room if you did that. So. What do you think about uh, about that, Cal? Um, I, I I disagree with uh, with Danny Lewis, but I'll tell you who could make sense at, at running back. Th- this is a good question. Okay, let's let's just say you needed to move somebody. 
uh, on and within you know position changes to let me ask you undefeated let's get what they have to say if you had to move somebody from from any side of the ball to the running back room let's just say they needed one more guy who would you move i'm going i'm automatically with emmanuel henderson um emmanuel henderson came in as a running back I think that, you know, based off the depth that they have at the wide receiver position, he could fit in there nicely. He could be kind of a one-two punch type guy that would be a, could be a running back, could be a, a wide receiver. Um, I, I, I think it was Matt from Mobile said uh, Kendrick Law. I mean, Kendrick Law, I mean, what is he, 220? Is he 210 pounds or something like that? So maybe similar size to like a Jam Miller uh, with the speed that he has. I don't know. who. Let, let's see. I, I'm curious to see. Uh, put uh, – Put um put Robbie Oots back there at 270 and give him the ball a couple times. <laughs> um, I, I don't know. I mean, I'm curious to see what you guys uh, have to say inside the comment box. Uh, wh- what else you say? Uh, what what else you got? Um, in terms of um, you know, what's on your mind with fall camp? Go ahead, man. Well, I kind of do agree with, with with that with you. I do agree with your question. The reason I said Danny Lewis because. He he, he could be that um guy. He, he could pick up yardage. Yes, he might not be as fast. But you could get him the ball. He could pick up, like, first down. And Miller could pin it, hand it to him, say, hey, give me some yardage, and he could pick it up. But, yeah, he, but, he's, but he's not going to, like, get him the ball like he won, like your appropriate fight does. But you can hand it to him. But, like, I do agree with your question about Manuel Henderson. I do, I, I do agree with that. I, do, I think I, I like that better about Manuel Henderson. What else? Uh, what What else is on your mind, Lucas? When you look at uh, fall camp storylines or things that you're kind of tracking uh, with this Alabama football team, as we get and someone said it inside the comment box, which I completely agree with, it is is the month running slow? It seems like we're like in that hamster wheel mode of August. We, and look, August is a long month, and you play on the last day of August. Like I felt July flew by, but now August, it seems like we're kind of stuck in the mud a little bit. Uh, and and I got one more question. Do you think do, do you think both sides of the ball? Do you think we balance? Do I think we're like Hello? like yeah? I'm here. Do you think like balance in terms of um what what do you mean by that, Lucas? Like on both sides, like the defense and the offense. Like, do, do you think we balance, or do, uh, do we have one side balance and and and, and one side off? Or, uh, uh, do you think we totally equal on 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 both sides of the ball? Yeah, I'll I'll answer on the other line, man. Thanks for the call, Lucas. I appreciate you joining us, man. That's Lucas uh, calling uh, from uh, Georgia. I appreciate it. Three one seven up next. Um, I I I think how I'm interpreting that question from Lucas is. Uh, maybe who's ahead right now in in terms of uh, you know which is the offense ahead of the defense? Maybe that's how I'm, I'm looking at the question. Uh, Lucas, I appreciate the call, man. Thanks for calling in from Georgia. Uh, we have a um, three one seven up next. And if you want to call in two zero five eight five zero nineteen ninety four, I think the offense is ahead of the defense. Um, I really do. I kind of look back to uh, Kane Womack. I had a chance to kind of rewatch and interpret what he said. And he said basically that uh, the offense, you know, and which is true in college football, you have kind of a, a script of plays that you want to run. And that's, um, you know, you strike first. And I think that's what happened in this scrimmage. But it gives the defense an opportunity to uh, kind of regroup and be ready for the next time that they match up. Because I would say that the offense beat the defense in the scrimmage. But then you could say maybe, you know, the defense uh, was able to get to the running back room or whatever it was. Uh, Because, I mean, clearly it was a physical scrimmage. But I think, um, you know, the offense is ahead of the defense, which I'm not surprised right now with all the weapons that they have on uh, the offense. And considering you had to kind of rebuild and retool this defense with a new schematic seam. Um, We go to the 317 uh, right next. Hey, you're on the line with Kyle Henderson. Who am I on the line with and where are you calling in from? Hey, good morning, Kyle. This is Marcus from St. Pete, man. Hey, what's up, Marcus? I appreciate you calling in, man. Thank you so much, man. I'm jelly that you're up in St. Pete, man. If I was uh, if I was in St. Pete, man, I'd be uh, I'd be doing the show from the beach for sure, man. What's up, man? I appreciate you calling in, and thanks for the continued support, Marcus. Go ahead, man. Absolutely. First off, I, I gotta say something, man. That dude who called into your show a few weeks ago, questioning the goat about him, his <laughs> on-field coaching ability. Don't ever let that dude call into your show again, man. I don't know what that dude was talking about. Coach Saban won six national championships at Alabama, what, eight or nine conference titles, and got into the playoff multiple times. I don't know what this dude's talking about. Yeah, and the thing, uh, and, and, the thing the, and the thing about Coach Saban, too, is kind of the the consistency that he had, right? 
regard and, and this was a, a, yeah. a lot of people don't take this into consideration I, and I think they will over time when we look back on coach Saban's career how many offensive coordinators left how many defensive coordinators left how many players left early exactly. for the NFL draft and coach Saban was able to retool every single year at the highest level exactly he was the only constant he, he was, was the, the only constant the, the only the there. only constant that was really here other than him was Jeff Allen and then for like a little run was was Pete Golding who was you know here for what like four seasons but so many assistant coaches were here gone and you know plucked away from coach Saban and he was the one constant um that was con- that was able to play at the highest level I, I'll always look back on the fact that so many players left. Imagine if most of, if if players couldn't leave early. How low did Coach Saban have like five more titles? Yeah, yeah, I, I agree. Uh, but since you're talking about defense, I had to say that, man. But since we're talking about the defense, <laughs> I wanted to know: Have you heard anything? If Coach Womack and the defensive staff are planning to keep and utilize that cheetah package from last season, the reason why I ask is I feel like our linebacker room has a lot of depth. I feel like the pass rushers can get after the ball with this swarm D. I mean, obviously we have mm-hmm. to see it live, but have you heard anything about them keeping, you know, putting three pass rushers on the field, coming out with a different schematic package to where they can cut those guys loose? Or that's seen anything that, in practice? That's a damn good question. I mean, the 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 cheetah package that that's a, that's amazing. That's um. That's a good question considering the type of wolves that you have on this team, right? A wolf position, the Q Rob, uh, you know, uh, the Quay Russo, uh, Yanzi Pierre. Um, each of these guys able to get after the quarterback. Uh, I think I'm, you know, I didn't mention Keanu Coat. There was a formation that they busted out. I don't know what it was called, but they had three the, three inside linebackers on there. They had Justin Jefferson, and he might be one of those guys considering he has that speed um, that they could utilize. Yeah. I, I just think like as we're talking depth and we're talking defensive standard at Alabama, um, the only area that I'm kind of, you know, a little bit uh, not necessarily concerned about, but I want to see how they're able to adapt to that secondary because there's young guys. Now, young guys can play at that level, but playing corner and being young is it's tough, right? I mean, imagine uh, Zabian Brown in the you know first if he's a starter, which I would imagine he is. Um, you know, the first five, six weeks, the amount that he's going to grow and the amount that he's going to be tested. If I'm Western Kentucky, I'm attacking him. If I'm South Florida, it's not necessarily oh, the, right, but like I'm going after him immediately. And if if I'm Georgia, the same thing, same thing with Tyler Van Dyke at Wisconsin. It's going to be a part of their game plan. They understand um, what Alabama has in secondary. To counter that, though, is a pass rush. And, um, you know, a couple weeks ago, I remember, remember Kane Womack when he talked about how many turnovers there were at the NFL and how it correlated with pass rush. Yeah. I thought that was probably pass the sound bite. Uh, yeah. the quarterback. Exactly. Yeah. And and so you start to hear of a LT Overton, a 280-pound ass kicker. You have, um, you know, other guys like a Q Rob. Or, I don't know. I kind of have a feeling Keanu Coates going to go crazy. If you played this game, NCAA football, Keanu Coates will, like, win the Heisman Trophy for you. Um, it, it, oh, Jesus. No, he's he's so dynamic. And, and people, he just hasn't had – you know, his, his, uh, like a true opportunity in, in Quay Russo as well. So I don't know. That's a really good question on that cheetah package. Um, I'll dive back into that. What else you got, Marcus? Uh, I, I'm not afraid to say it. I am a little concerned about the secondary. I would feel more confident if Caleb Downs stayed, uh, losing Rodell Williams sucked, losing Julian Sayan sucked, losing yeah. Isaiah Bond sucked, yeah. uh, Seth McLaughlin, no offense to that kid, but the snaps was an issue. Yeah. Good luck at OSU. I was okay with all that, but losing Caleb Downs was a big blow. I would feel way more confident in our secondary if Caleb Downs had stayed. I feel like he would have thrived in this defense as well. Um, but, I mean, you know, ultimately he moved on to, you know, Ohio State, but – now you got another freshman that you might be breaking in. You got guys who haven't played at Alabama that don't understand what it means to be in the secondary at Alabama and have a no-fly zone. Mm-hmm. So I am a little concerned about the secondary, but I also, I would say I have a cautious opti- optimism. Optimism, yeah. Like I'm cautiously optimistic about the way the secondary is going to perform. However, I do feel like if the defensive line and that you know, the Wolf and the Husky and everybody does their job and it speeds up the game for the quarterback, then they don't have that time to go through the progressions, which then it means it helps the secondary. It, it balances out having the experience for making the quarterback make a bad decision or throw it a little too soon or a little too late. Mm-hmm. But I, I am worried about the secondary some big time. 
Yeah, I, I mean, I am too. I think a lot of Alabama fans probably are. You know, if you take off, like, your glasses and you're like, everything's going to be great, you're like, you're kind of a little bit stressed about the secondary. You're like, okay. Now, now to counter that, you have Mo Lindquist. Um, man, that guy, I don't think he'll be here long at all. I, I, if I'm, you know, if I'm a school, that he, I know, man, like Mo Lin, having Mo Linquist and, and Kane Womack, man, he's, he's great. Um, but you look to this Alabama secondary and, and look, there, there's a, there's a lot of question marks about Damani Jackson too. I mean, I, we feel that he's going to be this guy that just comes in. Yeah. He, he has to prove himself here. He has to prove himself in a, a weekly SEC type environment. Like the the Pac-12, and, and we were talking about this yesterday on the show. People were like, you know, um, Kalen DeBoer is not getting the respect that he deserves. And I said, it's not because of what he's accomplished. It's about the conference that he's coming from. If you're an SEC country, yeah. we don't respect the Pac-12. Never did, never have. Like we see the Pac-12 as soft. We see it as a, a place that doesn't play elite defense. Um, and I think that's rang true over the, you know, over the last, like, what, five to seven years. Who's Who's been the best, like, the top-tier team that's played elite defense in the Pac-12? It, it doesn't exist. Um, so that's why people, they just don't understand. But, I mean, he, he's won everywhere he's gone. But Damani Jackson had to prove himself. Uh, the guy from Wake Forest, Deshaun Jones, he has to prove himself as well, coming in from uh, ACC school. Yep. Uh, and the freshmen, they haven't seen any type of action. Xavier Brown, as good as he is, or Red Morgan, who plays that Husky spot, uh, Zay Mincy, Jalen Abakwe, these guys have not played yet. So if you really want to, you know, go after Alabama's secondary, you have a right to. On the flip side, a lot of these guys that came in the secondary, they were here since uh, January. So are they really freshmen? Yeah. Do you get what I'm saying? Like, they went through all of the yeah, fourth yeah, quarter program. They played in the spring game in March and April. And they went through all of summer workouts, and now they've had August to, you know, battle, um, you know, in scrimmages and daily competitions. So are they really freshmen at this point? It's not like they just graduated high school. I mean, the summer enrollees are like Ryan Williams um, and a couple other guys, but most of the secondary players have been here since uh, the spring period. That's true. And then uh, the last thing I want to say with you is looking at um, – kind of shifting tones really quick, but looking at Bama's away games um, – the SEC games that they're going to play are going to be tough road games, but I want people to keep in mind that all three of those teams are also breaking in new quarterbacks. Mm. Like last year was Jalen Milrow's first year starting, so now he has a full year under his belt. Mm. He's, he knows what it's like to play in hostile SEC environments. Uh, don't get me wrong, I know Garrett Nussmeyer has experience, but he's going to be, I believe this is his first year starting. Yep. The Nico kid at Tennessee, this is going to be his first year, and mm. then the kid at Oklahoma, this will be his first year as well. Really so, good points. I I feel confident in those games that as long as the defense holds up and holds up their end of the bargain, that Alabama will get out of there unscathed. Um, but it's the other games that is going to be, you know, uh, a true test, I feel like, on Alabama's schedule. Um, I know everybody's looking towards the Georgia game, and I don't really know if I believe what Coach Smart is saying over there. I think maybe he's trying <laughs> to give his team some rap poison so they'll be motivated <laughs> for the season. Which I feel you, you know, you're the you're the you're the you know king of the cows. So you got to make sure your troops and everybody buys into the hype that you know everyone's gunning for you, which they are. But to act like they don't have depth, I, I don't believe that. Um, but I do. I just want to say, you know, everybody keep their heads up. I do believe Alabama's going to have a, a pretty good season, um, and I think that those away games, I think. Alabama's going to shock a lot of teams just because all those teams are breaking in new quarterbacks at the same time. Really, and I feel like yeah. that gives us the advantage. Really good point because if you look to the front end of Alabama's schedule, every single quarterback is experienced. But if you look to the back end of Alabama's schedule, it's the opposite, right? Like, just yeah. like, as your point said, yeah, that that's an interesting way to look at it. So those guys, those quarterbacks, will have time to you know have game experience by that point in time. With that said. When these back-end games start going, I mean, there's going to be so much on the line. Big-time college football environments, so much on the line now that you only have number one and number two playing in the SEC. Uh, but the road games for Alabama will also be challenging. I talked about this yesterday. Tennessee, LSU, going to Oklahoma. Regardless of how people feel about Oklahoma, I just think it's going to be a tough game. You never, I mean, it could be snowing in Oklahoma by November 23rd. I know it would be freezing. Um, so we'll just have to track, uh, track that, but I appreciate you calling in Marcus from uh, St. Pete's man. Call again, anytime. 
Absolutely, man. Roll Tide. Yeah, everybody. Roll Tide too, man. All right, take it easy. Uh, we got a 251 coming up next uh, right here on Bama Football on YouTube. I appreciate you guys being here. In, in case you missed it, uh, the AP came out this week. Um, this is their preseason top 25. You got Georgia, Ohio State, Oregon, Texas, Alabama, Ole Miss, Notre Dame, Penn State, Michigan, Florida State. Um, I, I told you before that I feel that Notre Dame and Penn State are both overrated. I, I don't really know about Florida State. Um, I'm excited to see how Roy Dell Williams does over there. And in fact, I haven't even really heard an update on him. Um, not that I read Florida State news. I, I think Malik Benson, who went over there, was injured. Um, Missouri, uh, they come to Alabama as well. So does uh, Alabama plays LSU. Alabama plays Tennessee. All those teams. Alabama plays Oklahoma. Those teams in the top 20. So I, I do think it is a challenging schedule for Alabama, specifically on that back end. And then, of course, you got the big one with Georgia. Taking the 2 5 one next. Let's do it. You're on the line with Kyle Henderson. Who am I on the line with and where are you calling in from? Hey, what's up, Kyle? This is Matt from Mobile. Matt, what's up? Um, we, yeah, we were just we we're just talking about you, uh, about your call. So now now's your chance to rebuttal, man. But uh, uh, thanks for calling yeah, in from uh, yeah yeah yeah. And thanks for calling in from LA. I mean, and as I was saying earlier, like the the high school football talent in in your area right now is crazy. Um, and it, and like Deontay Lawson, what was cool yesterday is he was he's able to hype up Ryan Williams considering you know they're they're both from uh from LA and uh you know he seemed pretty ha happy for uh, the young freshman but anyways Matt from Mobile had a pretty uh, exciting call um a couple days ago and he's back on the show man so Matt come with him man welcome on in Yeah there's there's there is there Mobile has produced a lot of talent I, I went to uh a, a St. Paul's down here in Mobile and oh. uh, and they had a uh, AJ AJ McCarron and a, a few other guys that are in the in the NFL. Um, but uh, uh, I played basketball. I was not uh, was not a good football player at all. <laughs> but uh, but I uh, but I love Alabama football. And all I was saying the other day, uh, so I was not questioning uh, Nick Saban's goatness mm -hmm. at all. Uh, he's Nick Saban is the king you know, of, of, of coaching, just like Tiger Woods is the king of golf and Michael Jordan is the, is the king of basketball. And, uh, and I don't question that at all. I don't, I do not, I do not question Nick Saban's goatness at all. So, um, but, but what the question I do have though, and even Tiger Woods and Michael Jordan will tell you all of their weaknesses, even, even the goats and the Kings of, of their, of their leagues have, have weaknesses, right? And, um, and I would say, my, and this is just a question that I'm asking. I don't know the answer to this question. But my question is, when you compare giving Nick Saban a roster that is clearly uh, lacking and clearly incomplete, how does Nick Saban perform? Mm. That's, that's my question. Well, he was given that opportunity right when he came to Alabama, and I think his, his record was 7-6. and six. Mm. Uh, now, now, uh, Kalen DeBoer, when you give him a roster that's even worse than Alabama's 2017, what does Kalen DeBoer do with that roster? He goes 10 and two. That was his first, that was his first year at Washington. Mm. And so I'm not comparing goatness levels. I'm comparing, I'm comparing how does this coach do when they're given an incomplete roster? How good of an actual coach are they? Not not the recruiting aspect of coaching. Yeah. How good of an actual coach are they when when given uh, less quality tools? Okay. Mm -hmm. So that's that's my that's my question. We don't know that really about Nick Saban because he's always had what is what I just I just heard like Bama had the uh, highest recruiting class over the last five years. That's how it's been at Bama. So we. So that's the only point I was making is that. We don't know for sure how good of a coach Nick Saban is with with uh, less quality tools. Am I am I am I wrong about that? Where am I wrong? I think the only part that you could probably and th this is my opinion. I appreciate the call uh, on with Matt from Mobile. I I think you could point to like you know how he coached in the NFL, right, with the Dolphins and kind of the way that that worked out. But my my counter to to you is I I feel that Coach Saban. And you probably look at him during different points of his career. I think that Nick Saban is just such a good master of uh, 
psychology in terms of coaching that he's going to develop a team. I'm, I'm, a, I'm behind Coach Saban, regardless of the team that he takes over. I just feel that he'd be able to lead the, a team that had less caliber to, you know, a bowl game. Um, I think he'd be able to do that. Now, Coach Kalen DeBoer has also done that, too. I mean, you look at uh, even where he started out in his career and then to, you know, Fresno uh, and then to Washington. So I, I think they're both able to do it. Um, so I, I don't agree with you on this point, um, but I could see where you're coming from. I mean, it is worth the chew on. I mean, I, I was thinking, I mean, you did have me thinking uh, for a little bit, but then I was like, no, nah, like I, I'm taking Coach Saban with a, a lesser type, to, you know, like a, a rebuilding mode. You know, I, I think Coach Saban could do it. Um, what, what, what's your take on that, Matt? And what else you got regarding fall camp? Matt? Matt left. Matt called back. I don't know what happened to you, man. Um, but Matt with the call from Mobile. Let me ask you before I go. I, do you think Coach Saban could rebuild? Now, look, it's tough to win um, at, at a variety of places. Like, I, I like okay, I'll go back to, like, my alma mater, New Mexico State, right? And what Jerry Kill was able to do at New Mexico State last year, that was damn impressive. I mean, they're able to go beat Auburn. Um, that was the first time that New Mexico State ever beat an SEC type team, right? It beat Hugh Freeze. While Hugh Freeze is talking about he should be four and zero against um what uh you know Nick Saban. I don't know. Jerry Kill gave him all his money's worth, whether he was at coaching against him against Liberty or against Auburn. I mean, he's just a good football coach. And now he's at uh, Vanderbilt, which will be interesting because Alabama goes up to Nashville to play Vanderbilt with the same quarterback that he had, which is Diego Pavia. Um, so I uh, just think that's interesting. But I appreciate the call, Matt, call in any time. We went from uh, we went from St. Pete's to um, to uh, Mobile. We got two more calls uh, lined up. We got an 8 6 five, and We'll take it right now. Hey, what's going on? You're on the line with Kyle what's Henderson. Up, Kyle? Who am I on the line with and where are you calling in from? What's up, Kyle? It's Angel from Pitcher Forge again. Angel, what's up, man? I appreciate you being here, man. Welcome on to the show, man. Come with it. What's up, man? Yeah. Uh, yes, I thought fall camp so far was pretty good with, you know, the players getting, getting you know, jacked and everything. But I, re I really do think that, uh, that Kevin DeBoer is going to be just fine with the players and he knows what he's doing. I mean, he's proven enough to be a great head coach. He's already beaten Steve Sarkeesian twice. And I think he's going to do fine in the ACC, even though it's a different type of ball game than the West Coast. And uh, as far as uh, Hugh Freeze goes, that guy is just a clown. He's a scumbag and a clown. Because <laughs> he doesn't know what he's talking about when he's Freeze. I mean, he can't get the job done against Nick Saban, saying he was sitting before. No, well, he choked on both of those games in the fourth quarter. <laughs> And, you know, and it's ridiculous what he's saying, you know, because, you know, he freezes, is Hugh Freeze, but I can't stand the guy. I, be, I really do believe he's going to get fired pretty soon because Auburn sucks. And, you know, you know, everybody hates Auburn. There's no excuse to lose in New Mexico State. And, and I don't think he'll last longer in the ACC. I'll give him, like, a year or two. That's it. And as far as Texas and Oklahoma – they're they're gonna have a rude awakening, and and they're they're gonna they're gonna they're gonna wish they're gonna be back in the uh, Big Twelve, because and uh because they can't I don't think they can handle it. I mean Oklahoma can't because you know they they're pretty terrible with their quarterback. I mean he can't really throw a ball to save his life. What I saw against him in Arizona, I mean he he was terrible. Like an Oklahoma game. I'm not too worried about it. And Jackson Arnold ain't that great of a quarterback. And uh, what do you think about Jackson Arnold as the quarterback for Oklahoma? I don't think he's a threat. Yeah, I like uh, like Marcus was saying. You know, those back end quarterbacks are all new. I mean, I would have been concerned about Dylan Gabriel. I've always liked Dylan. Dylan Gabriel's uh, game. I understand, you know, he had to make the change up to Oregon for the bag, and I think he'll have a successful season. I don't really know too much about um, Oklahoma's new quarterback. I have to watch him kind of in action. Um, so, yeah, I, I don't know um, how he'll do, but I, 
I'm, I'm curious to see how Oklahoma and Texas, they fare this year. Uh, did you see that Texas just lost another running back? They've had two running backs yes. um, that are already out for the entire season. I mean, Bama's room is a little bit banged up, but that's just kind of like, you know, maybe ice on the calf or whatever, like nothing major. Um, they've lost two yeah. running backs for the entire season all year. And that's when you start to look to your debt. I mean, emergency situations, who else can play running back? Cause how many other scholarship running backs do you think they have? Maybe three. Um, so that, Not that many. yeah, if you're a, if you're a um, Texas fan, you're probably sweating right now because, uh, you lost another quality running back. Michigan now. Yeah. Yeah. That, I mean, yeah, I'm worried about the Michigan game now because they lost two, court, two, two running backs. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I mean, that's pretty vital. And at least have like, uh, well, I guess the the max I would think for a running back is at least four or five running backs because you don't know who's going to get hurt, who's going to you know, you know take the rock. But I'm I'm pretty glad that Alabama doesn't have those injuries because those are pretty brutal injuries with the torn meniscus and all that. I would hate to be that kid that get injured, supposed to have a pretty great season, and all of a sudden it gets ruined in practice. I mean, it's gonna be it's gonna be terrible for them on the sidelines because I couldn't imagine being injured like that, want to contribute to your team and lose it all in practice. And that's where you gotta be careful in practice because if you don't, you're gonna get hurt. And I really think that practices should be good, like you know, should be hard, right? But at the same time, you gotta take it easy a little bit until the season starts because you gotta prepare for the situation. That's why. Those coaches get paid enough money to like uh, make sure they're going pretty good with their nutrition and all that. And I think it's going to be brutal for this 12 team playoff. I think I really think a lot of people can get hurt this year because of the injuries and the 12 and was it 15 games? I mean, if, uh, back, if, you, if you play games. for the championship, you probably play close to 16 games, I think. Um, but, uh, anyways, uh, yeah, but I appreciate the, the call angel on the back end of the show, man. Call again anytime, man. I appreciate you, uh, calling in today. Thank you, man. All right. Take it easy. Roll All time, right. Man. Yeah. Roll tie to you. Uh, Hey fam. Um, I, I'm pressed for time today, so I appreciate it. Uh, thanks for calling, uh, today and joining the show. If I didn't get to you, I'll uh, get to you again, uh, tomorrow, which will be August 15th. What to watch today. Uh, Alabama will have another fall camp. So you get to hear from, uh, offensive coaches and uh, get some more footage from the Alabama Crimson Tide. Um, you have another scrimmage on Saturday, and then Alabama has its first official game on August 31st. So we made it to a football month, okay? So let's just kind of survive in advance through the opening of school and uh, get to that first game of the season. Can't wait, and let's just hope these guys, uh, you know, stay healthy because as you see, you continue to see, you know, guys being injured. It's it's part uh, of the game. It happens, and um, you, know, you just got to be thankful that you have Jeff Allen uh, who does an amazing job, him and his entire staff. I mean, it's just not him. He just don't have, like, one trainer. He has, like, 30 people that are under him that do an amazing job for these uh, student athletes at the University of Alabama. My name is Kyle Henderson. You can catch me live every single day from Monday to Friday at 9 a.m. I replay the show at 12 in case you missed it. Also available on Spotify. And then I package, um, you know, footage, interviews, and replay that or, or uh, play that in the evening time for everybody to check out once everybody's home and has had some time to kind of uh, get back, um, you know, from their, uh, you know, work or whatever. So I appreciate you guys joining me uh, um, in the morning, lunch, and in the evening. My name is Kyle Henderson, live also as uh, breaking news happens. And I really appreciate you guys being here for the segment today. If you like the show, hit the thumbs up. And uh, I'll catch you next time right here on Bamo Football on YouTube from Tuscaloosa, Alabama.